Welcome searchers and seekers. Today we start the book of the prophet Isaiah. This is a really fascinating book and the writing here is very literary and artistic and I think you'll really like it. It's uh, very poetic. Uh, he uses a great vocabulary, great metaphors, great ideas. The book of Isaiah actually is a collection of writings from a variety of writers um, and the first one is Isaiah of Jerusalem uh, then we have someone else in his school writing from the exile in Babylon and then we probably have a third one could be the same as the second one but we have a third one who writes when the Israelites have returned to, Jude, to Judea to Jerusalem uh, so this is a very fascinating book it's very influential uh, for Christianity and Judaism um, and it's also very influential for its uh, picture of God, picture of the divine. I think that you will find that many of the ideas and vocabulary that we have learned from earlier books will really help in understanding Isaiah. Times are difficult uh, for Isaiah of Jerusalem. Um, we've had um, the threat of Assyria coming down in, and they will um, take the ten tribes into exile. They threaten Judea. Uh, and so there's war with these great empires, which Israel had not <clears throat> really seen before. Most of the wars up until this point were Israel fighting its neighbors, uh, who were equally small. Uh, but these uh, massive armies of large empires are just overwhelming. This is where we get some proto-apocalyptic and some apocalyptic ideas, uh, end of the world ideas, final battle ideas, the day of judgment of God. Um, and we see that that comes out of the reality of the wars with Assyria and Babylon. So the first chapter, Isaiah calls upon the heavens and the earth to listen to what he's saying. So this is, um, you could look at this as a case, a legal case against Israel. And there are other parts where um, he will say, come let us argue it out, as if, if this is a legal case that Yahweh is bringing. In chapter, in chapter 1, verse 2, uh, the word Lord is used for God. Whenever you see Lord with four capitals, it's translating Yahweh. Yahweh is the specific national God. It's a personal name, uh, the, the national God of Israel. Uh, it does not mean Lord. Uh, so whenever you see Lord here, you should, you should think <laughs> it's Yahweh. Also in verse 3, Israel is used. Uh, we've looked at a lot of texts where Israel referred to the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, and Judah referred to uh, <clears throat> the one or two tribes, Judah, and sometimes another tribe. Uh, but here Israel is being used by Isaiah for the entire community, and there are reasons for that. He mentions Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem, which is associated with Judea. So when he uses Israel here it, in the first chapter, it's referring to all of the people of Yahweh. Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth, for Yahweh has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. So here you see this case against uh, Israel. Um, the people are like the children of God, and they're, they're being disobedient. They don't listen. One thing you will see in Hebrew poetry is a lot of doublets, where you'll have the same idea expressed very succinctly in two different ways. So you just have to get used to that. And actually, as I've been reading it over the years and decades, it has. Um, I really appreciate the, the difference it is from just plain prose. But Israel does not know, my people do not understand. So again, that's a repetition of the same idea. And you just have to get used to it. That is how poetry um, and prophetic oracles are composed in ancient Israel. Verse 4 of Isaiah. Ah, sinful nation, people laden with iniquity. 
offspring who do evil, children who deal corruptly. So that is four. That is um, a doublet of doublets. So the, the, the point is being made. Now, children who deal corruptly. So the children of God, the people of Israel. Uh, so Isaiah will be talking a lot about social justice issues. He will be talking about corruption, bribery, materialism, consumerism. This is much different than what we've seen in many of the historical books uh, and even in the Torah. Isaiah is not just making an argument, believe in Yahweh, worship only Yahweh. Yes, he makes that argument, but he also says, he, he also says care for the orphan, care for the widow. Uh, so he has an interest in the compassionate care of the weaker members of society. So as a religious impulse, he is making use of the ideas of compassion uh, for the less fortunate. And it continues with uh, another doublet, who have forsaken Yahweh, who have despised the Holy One of Israel. And that is one of the terms that Isaiah uses a lot, the Holy One of Israel. What is holiness? Uh, it, it's not actually precisely defined in the Hebrew Scriptures, but I, I think we we can have an immediate sense of what it is. M most societies have a distinction between the sacred and the profane, uh, the holy and the secular, and so this is one of his preferred terms, the Holy One of Israel. But things have not been going well. The invasions uh, have made a mark. Verse 5. Why do you seek further beatings? <clears throat> so the people are getting these beatings. They're getting them from Assyria. Why do you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head. There is no soundness in it. But bruises and sores and bleeding wounds. They have not been drained or bound up or softened with oil. So oil would be a way of treating wounds. So very graphic. Um, I think one thing you'll find with Isaiah is he is a great writer. This is, I think, some of the best early literature in the world. Now, in verse 7, we continue with this theme of destruction and desolation. And this is probably a description of the historical events of around 701 BCE when Assyria invaded the north. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, aliens devour your land. It is desolate, as overthrown by foreigners. And daughter Zion, that's Jerusalem, is left like a booth and a vineyard, like a shelter in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. So I like those images. So when a city is besieged, normally all the uh, outside areas are conquered because they don't have walls. And then you have this walled city in the middle. So that's sort of like a, a tent or booth for the workers to get in the shade in, in a vineyard or in um, a farm. And so Israel is like, uh, Jerusalem is like that. It is this lone booth being surrounded by others. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. So he goes back to this image of destruction that we have seen in Genesis. Hear the word of Yahweh, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. So burnt offerings, etc. I haven't I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. So here's another theme of Isaiah and some of the other prophets is that the sacrifice of animals is just not enough. It's not cutting it. It's God, Yahweh, is looking for something more than merely the sacrifice of animals. So Isaiah is bringing up uh, a very potent criticism of some of the ancient practices of sacrifice. And he's looking and he's, he's saying uh, there's something more. 
some of the earlier texts in the Hebrew Scriptures were actually saying that God is very pleased by these, these sacrifices. Yahweh enjoyed the sweet smell of the burnt offerings, the smell of the barbecue. So that was very anthropomorphic. That was very much looking at God as if God were a human being writ large. So this is a different way of looking at that. He goes on 12. When you come to appear before me, or when you come to my face, that's the way uh, it would be phrased in the Hebrew, um, when you come before someone's face, it's, it's when you come in their presence, that's how the language works. Who has asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon, so that would be um, when the moon is very dark and there's um, sacrifices and, and festivals, and Sabbath and calling of convocation. I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. So I will not pay attention to you. I will not hear your supplications. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. So that is that justice theme. Uh, that caring for the uh, least fortunate in your society that Isaiah is calling people to. Verse 18, come now, let us argue it out, says Yahweh. So let us argue it in the sense of a legal case at the, at the gate of a city, as if you were arguing both sides, or before a king or a judge. Though your sins are like scarlet, they can become like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they can become like wool. So sin is described as a red color, perhaps, dealing with blood. Blood is often considered unclean, and blood is a symbol and sign of death, and there's been plenty of death with these wars. So what a beautiful, uh, what beautiful poetry here. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. And he repeats it again. The, uh, the Hebrew doublet. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool, so white as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. What we have seen so far is a criticism of the rituals of religion as an inadequate accounting of what Yahweh is really interested in. Yahweh is interested in the moral stance of people, how you treat other people, and not just bringing the incense, bringing the sacrifices, but do you care for others? And now Isaiah talks about the holy city, Jerusalem, and he's very critical of what's happened there, how the faithful city has become a whore. She that was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murders, murderers. Your silver has become dross, your wine is mixed with water, your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. Uh, so he's talking about the corruption of society, uh, bribery, people looking for special gifts, uh, this is just corruption, and uh, he has noticed it. And we haven't really perhaps seen a, a lot of this in the Hebrew Scriptures so far, but this uh, ability to criticize one's own society is a hallmark of the prophets. They do not defend the orphan. The widow's cause does not come before them. So he keeps saying that, uh, but in a different way. Therefore, says the sovereign, the king, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. So Lord of hosts. Lord over a group, Yahweh over a, a group. This would be the, the divine court up in heaven where Yahweh has uh, various angels, seraphim, um, various other um, divine beings, angels, messengers, 
uh, or it, perhaps even an army. So a Yahweh of hosts is where Yahweh also resides, not just in the temple on earth in Jerusalem, but also in, in heaven, in his throne and court there. And that is important because if and when Jerusalem is destroyed, there will be a sense that Yahweh is also in his divine, in his uh, heavenly court. So it's not the total destruction. So it's almost as if the, the temple uh, in Jerusalem is sort of a, a secondary residence for Yahweh. Because of all this corruption and evil, even in Jerusalem, Yahweh will purge or clean Jerusalem by destruction, uh, as if in a furnace where the dross is burned away and you're left with the metal you're seeking. I will smelt away all your dross and remove all your alloy. I've turned my hand against you, and I will restore your judges as at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward you shall be called city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed by justice, and those in her who repent by righteousness. For you shall be ashamed of the oaks in which you delighted. So the oaks, the large trees, and open places where there were indigenous religious practices uh, for some of the other gods. So um, Isaiah still condemns these uh, practices in worship of other gods. So a lot of amazing poetry and really new and exciting religious ideas uh, from Isaiah. Now we're in chapter 2 of the book of Isaiah. In the days to come, the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All nations shall stream to it. So Jerusalem is on a small mountain, a large hill, uh, but it's not the, the tallest mountain in the, the whole area. Um, but So he's using this as a metaphor. And he makes the claim that all nations shall stream to it. And later on in the text, similar claims are made. And this is just amazing. This is really amazing in 2 2. Why would Isaiah say this? Assyria is coming down to uh, destroy and may have already destroyed uh, much of uh, Israel, the house of Jacob, the northern tribes. And Israel, Judah, is such a small part of the Middle East. Um, Egypt, uh, Syria, Babylon are hundreds of times larger. Why would Isaiah say this? So he has prophesied um, uh, about Jerusalem becoming this world center. And it's hard to know why he would say that because there's really no evidence for that. And yet, in a strange way, it's actually come true, because if you look at uh, Judaism as the founder of Christianity and other religions, indeed, uh, Jerusalem has become a place of tribute for many of the nations and many of the peoples. But uh, besides that, this is just an amazing statement. Is it hubris? Is it grandiose? Is it arrogant? Uh, nevertheless, uh, Isaiah is making these very bold claims. Isaiah continues, Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, or Torah, religious teaching, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And that may uh, sound familiar because it is also contained in the book of Micah, Micah the prophet, chapter 4. Verse 3, he shall, he shall judge between many peoples and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. 
and so uh, we're not so sure who copied whom uh, or if both Micah and Isaiah were um, using the material of another unnamed prophet. This is a very famous passage uh, about peace and forging swords into plowshares and the hope for there being no war. Um, this perhaps has not literally occurred and Jerusalem has not been a center for this because of its its long history of war and conflict. But this is also a beautiful expression of uh, peace and it is uh, has become a theme in, in many cultures and languages. So Isaiah here is also very influential. Uh, this is just great literature. All of this writing so far with Isaiah has just been uh, great uh, in terms of poetry, content, philosophy, and religious instruction, or Torah. Further in chapter 2, we see a condemnation of the house of Jacob in verse 5, 2 verse 5. And house of Jacob is probably the ten northern tribes, what, you, what can also be called Israel. And this is in part because there will be a condemnation of the southern kingdom in chapter 3. Come, let us walk in the light of Yahweh, for you have forsaken the ways of your people, O house of Jacob. Indeed, they are full of diviners from the east, and soothsayers like the Philistines. They, clap, they clasp hands with foreigners. Their land is filled with silver and gold, and there's no end to treasures. Their land is filled with horses, and there's no end to chariots. Their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. So this is a, another way, instead of just saying they bow down to idols, he writes that they are the work of their hands to what their own fingers have made. And so people are humbled and everyone is brought low. Do not forgive them. So this is all the, the sin of following many of the other religions. And in verse 10, we see the punishment. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of Yahweh, from the glory of his majesty. So this is the idea of it's hiding in caves, uh, hiding um, from the many caves in Palestine. And we will see that later too in this chapter. Uh, and this is probably what actually happened with the Assyrians coming in. People fled the cities, hid in caves. The haughty eyes of people shall be brought low, and the pride of everyone shall be humbled. Uh, so there's punishment here. Um, uh, people were arrogant, haughty. Um, full of themselves. And the Lord alone will be exalted on that day, Yahweh alone. For Yahweh of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up and high. So this is the idea of the day, the, the, the day of judgment. In uh, chapter 3, we have a condemnation of Judah and uh, Jerusalem. God will take away all support. I will make boys their princes, so the young and experienced will be the princes. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen. Verse 13, the Lord rises to argue his case. He stands to judge the peoples. And he also judges the daughters of Jerusalem. The Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing along as they go, a tinkling with their feet, so as if they have anklets on their feet. Yahweh will afflict with scabs the heads of the daughters of Zion, Jerusalem, and Yahweh will lay bare their secret parts. In that day the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands, and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets, and the scarves. So he keeps repeating all of this uh, jewelry that is, is going to be taken away. So maybe we could translate this into more modern terms. Isaiah is, is speaking against materialism and consumerism, uh, all the jewelry that the women of Jerusalem are wearing. Uh, and he's, he's calling them back to more an authentic kind of life. So that is what the, um, the rationale for this is. It's not just that he hates jewelry. Um, because it, it speaks of uh, a lack of inner depth. And of Jerusalem, her gates shall lament and mourn, ravaged, she shall sit upon the ground. 
uh, sit, so sitting upon the ground is, is the worst possible place to sit. And so in verse 24, he's listed all the things that are not going to be there. And he says, instead of perfume, there will be a stench. And instead of a sash, a rope. Instead of well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a rich robe, a binding of sackcloth. Instead of beauty, shame. Your men shall fall by the sword, and your warriors in battle. And her gates shall lament and mourn. Ravaged, she shall sit upon the ground. Uh, so why why would Jerusalem or Zion sit upon the ground? Well, that's the worst place to sit for a woman uh, at that time or, or anyone. Uh, you don't have a chair. Uh, you don't have a couch. You don't have uh, a throne. Uh, you're just sitting on the ground outside. Seven women shall take hold of one man in that day. So there are, there are fewer men. They've all been killed in battle. So this is his condemnation of Jerusalem. But the destruction of Jerusalem is not permanent. Yahweh will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over its places an assembly, a cloud by day and smoke and the shining of a flaming fire by night. So the, this idea of smoke and fire being a symbol of the presence, uh, the awesome presence of God. Indeed, over all the glory there will be a canopy. It will serve as a pavilion. And so... Um, the destruction of Jerusalem is not uh, is not permanent. Uh, the city will be rebuilt, and the presence of God will be there. Uh, the smoke and the fire are reminiscent of the Torah and in the desert when the Israelites were led by God in um, a pillar of smoke or a pillar of fire. So that that awesome presence is symbolized with fire. And that's true of many religions. Fire is um, very beautiful, interesting, animated. Uh, and so that's a symbolic, uh, uh, that's symbolic of the glory of Yahweh or God.